Okay, great. It seems that we are ready to go ahead with that. Um, so first, I would like to welcome, welcome you all to this uh, Eden session on democratizing research and science ways forward. Um, this session aims to reflect on how research and science is currently produced. Uh, we want to discuss uh, ways we can actually make research and science more inclusive, open, and democratic. Uh, and for this session, we have three very interesting talks. Uh, Jess, can you show us the next slide, please? Thank you. So the first talk is from Jess, Jess Carr, and it's about uh, what makes a researcher. Uh, it's going, she's going to talk about participatory and inclusive research uh, with uh, people from excluded communities. Uh, the second talk is from myself, and it's about opening research to non-professionals through what do we call this community-led citizen science. And the third talk is from Bart Bartrientes. Uh, he should be joining us in a few minutes. And it's about open science and scholarship in relation to learning analytics. Um, so, uh, Let's move. I guess we are ready to move to our first talk. Uh, Jess, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thea. So, hi, everybody. My name is Jess Carr. I am a postdoctoral uh, post researcher in the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. So today I'm going to talk to you about my PhD project, uh, specifically looking at the inclusive research methods that we used when I worked with um, a group of adults with learning disabilities. So specifically, I worked with a charity called My Life, My Choice, who are based in Oxfordshire here in the UK, who work with adults with learning disabilities, helping with self-advocacy. So the first thing I would like for us all to do is to have a think about what makes a researcher. So I would like you to go to the um, menti.com and pop in that code. If, if that doesn't work, I'm just going to pop into the chat a link that you can go that will take you straight to the Mentimeter. If you've not used Mentimeter before, it's um, just an online platform where we can all put answers in and we can see the results come up together. So I'm just going to switch my screen over. Uh, so that we can have a look. So on there, what I would like you to do when you get to the website is pop in three terms or words that you think describe the essential characteristics of a researcher. So take a couple of minutes to think about it, because I know it's quite a big question. Um, but yeah, have a think about what you think to make, makes a researcher. What do you need to be or have to be a researcher? Great, so we're getting some wonderful words coming in. So knowledge, intellectual capital, uprightness, networking, trustworthy, sincereness, independence. Um, they're all really interesting words. And if anybody does want to say anything around the words that they put up, either pop something in the chat or feel free to turn your camera on or your mic on and have a chat about it. Uh, creativity is a great one. We'll get into that later on. Uh, inquisitive, trustworthy, integrity, yeah, so these are all words relating to kind of um, personality characteristics, which I think is a, a really great way to look at it. I wonder if anyone has any ideas on um, education backgrounds or um, something that's not necessarily about the our personalities. Um, open for collaboration, that's a great one. So some, a couple of the ones that are coming up most of, most often. So we've got creativity there twice, trustworthy, curiosity. Um, and I think those are really interesting ideas about what makes a researcher. So I'm just going to switch back quickly. Ooh, two seconds. Right. So now we've had a look at that. What I want to show you... Uh, is a picture of the research that I was doing. So I've blanked out the faces of my co-researchers uh, for their anonym anonymity. I can never say that word. Um, what I want to discuss here are the three different co-researchers that we've got. So we've got people who come from different educational backgrounds. We've got people who have different lived experiences. We've got a mixture of people who are both neurodivergent and neurotypical. And we've got people who have differing expertise. Uh, all the people in this photograph are conducting research. Now, what I would like you to do is go back to your Mentimeter and I will move the slide along. 
And I would just like you to vote as to whether you think that all of the people who were in that photograph classify as a researcher. Just from the very basic description that I've given you there. So you're getting lots of yeses in, which is really great to see. Um, I wonder if anybody would like to expand on why they think that everyone in that photograph is a researcher. Uh, if you do, you can just pop something in the chat box or um, turn your microphone on and, and say it to the group. Uh, if not, no worries. I know it can be a bit stressful having to suddenly talk in, in a big group, so feel free. But yeah, it's all yeses, which is really nice to see. So the reason I'm asking this question, oh, you cannot activate your mics. Oh no. Well, yeah, just pop, pop something in the, in the chat. Um, I'm not entirely sure how, how I would activate other people's mics. I don't think I have that control. Um, so yeah, just pop, pop something in the chat. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. That's yeah. Be interesting to hear from the maybe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, perhaps a better question would be, why wouldn't they be considered researchers based on the short summary that you provided? That's a really interesting one. And when I've done similar presentations before, um, a lot of the talk around perhaps why they might not be considered a researcher is based on the academic backgrounds. Um, so in that picture, you had myself. So I'll go back to the slide, actually. Um, in that picture, you had myself, who was a PhD student at the time. And there you've got two people who have uh, very limited or no educational qualifications. Um, to some people within the academic community, that does disqualify them from being able to classify themselves as a researcher, which is why I wanted to open this up for discussion in the group to start with, especially um, because the rest of my talk is based on inclusive research, where the, the term co-researchers is a very key part of the definition of inclusive research. So there's a quick little introduction, a little thought exercise for us all. Um, let's move it along, though. So I'm not sure how many people here have experience of inclusive research. Uh, it's only been around but it's only been classified as a research approach since about 2008, when Wormsley and Johnson termed the approach as an inclusive research study. Uh, when I started doing my PhD, I knew I wanted to work with adults with learning disabilities, but I, ve I knew very little about research approaches. You know, I, I hadn't been in research, I hadn't been in academia since I left my undergrad about four years earlier. Um, but I had been working in the charity sector with adults with learning disabilities. And I came across this great paper um, by a woman called Melanie Nind. She's amazing. And she, um, she asked the question, what is the research? Is it research for, is it re research with, or is it research on? Um, this is a really important question when considering inclusive research, because many inclusive researchers will say that it is research with. Um, the idea behind that is that you're not doing research for someone. You're, that idea puts you kind of in this holy place where you're this amazing person who's coming in and doing research for them. They need your help. Research on is going back to thinking about um, perhaps slightly more medical, medical trials, uh, clinical trials, where these people that we're engaging are a subject rather than someone who you are working alongside. Now, that's a very key part of inclusive research. You're not doing inclusive research unless you are doing research with the people that you're trying to work with. Um, and this can be reflected in Walsley and Johnson's principles for inclusive research. Now, because they termed it, these are kind of considered very um, important. There are lots of principles out there, as there are with many, many, you know, pretty much every research approach. You can go and look in a literature review and find a gazillion different ways that people say you should do it. Um, but Walsley and Johnson is kind of hailed as, as the original. So that's why I've chosen it for here. Uh, 
So the first principle that research must address issues that really matter to the learning disabled community and ultimately leads to improved lives for them. Now, when we're doing research with them, we're asking the questions, we're involving them from the very get go. Therefore, they get the control and the power to be able to say whether this does actually matter to them. It's very easy for us as researchers or just people who work in academia to make assumptions about things, especially with marginalised communities. You know, we see that they're not being engaged in something so we just assume that they would want to be and that they need to be that's a great assumption to make because the idea behind it is um is that you want to open up your world to these other communities and you want to share what you've been able to experience with them however there's there's a chance they really don't care you know that sounds like a really horrible thing to say but there is there is a chance that's just not got anything to do with them um, sorry, just quickly in the chat, does the learning disability also include disadvantaged groups not having easy access to learning? Yes, yes. Um, in, in this specific study, um, in the one that I'm talking about, I worked with a group of people who were diagnosed as learning disabilities, so it was a medical condition. But inclusive research in general doesn't necessarily, you don't have to have a diagnosis to be classed as someone with a learning disability. Like you say, it could be of someone who does not have access to easy access to learning. Um, Thank you for bringing that up. I wouldn't have actually thought to mention that. Um, so the next principle, that it must access and represent their views and experiences. Again, this comes from the idea that we have these assumptions, we come up with a hypothesis that we believe to be true, and we do our research. And a lot of research papers, a lot of the outputs that come from research might are very academic in their nature. Inclusive research, and in particular, the newer papers that are coming out are all easy read so that involves using photographs and speech that is easily understood rather than academic jargon in order to represent the views and experiences of the people who you've actually done the research with. Um, off, so often we see that an academic or a group of academics when they're writing a paper will write about the people that they worked with um, but actually by doing something like an easy read document you can include uh, the group that you are working with in that writing process. So it's a much better way of accessing and representing their views and experiences. The final principle that people with learning disabilities need to be treated with respect by the research community. I'm sure for a lot of us on this call, it sounds like an obvious thing, um, but unfortunately it isn't always. Research in general can be, and in particular the research community, can be a very elitist and hierarchical place. We put a lot of emphasis on educational background. So it's very important when you're doing inclusive research that you understand that whilst, yes, you may have a PhD, a master's, an undergrad, and these people may not, you might have a, um, a better understanding of how a research process works than them. It doesn't mean that they don't deserve your res respect. And most importantly, it doesn't mean that they know more than you in other ways. It, for me personally, I went into this study as someone who does not have a learning disability. So whilst I might have known a bit more about the research process, I did not know anything about being a person who lived with a learning disability. I did not know how that affected day-to-day -day life. I could guess from my work in charities, but I didn't have that lived experience. And it was very important that I then respected that they had that that they had more knowledge than me in that situation. I'm just gonna have, before I go to the next slide, have a quick look at the chat. Uh, I've seen that someone's asked a question. Interested of medical classification. Yeah, so I think learning, just the, the um, terminology around learning disability is frequently changing and it's, um, it's very hard to keep up with to start with. So now uh, often you'll hear terms like neurodivergent over a learning disability. In certain paper, in certain journals, you'll hear it discussed as an intellectual disability. You'll hear it discussed as a learning, um, learning differences, all, all these different terms. Um, and if you go onto like a, a the NHS in the UK or other health bodies in different countries, they will have their own terminology relating to learning disability. But a lot of people will live with what we would, what you might consider a learning disability and not have visited a doctor or have a diagnosis. Um, and actually inclusive research specifically tries to move away from those medical classifications. It's all based around the idea that there is a medical model of disability and that by 
terming someone as having a disability, you automatically create barriers and differences within their lives. Whereas actually moving to a social model where you understand that it's not necessarily a the, the differences that might, they might have, it's actually the social approach to a learning disability which disables a person. So that's where that's kind of coming from in terms of the way that they classify a learning disability within inclusive research. Okay, so I, I'm just going to talk about how you might do this research. Um, within the inclusive research literature, there is an awful lot of um, different ways in which to do inclusive research. Because it's quite a new term and it's quite a new approach, a lot of people are still working it out. Um, and that makes it a really interesting and sometimes difficult approach to use. So I'm going to use a bit of my own experience to talk about this. Um, so firstly, the term co-researchers uh, will come up a lot in inclusive research literature. And a large part of that is to create an equitable research environment. So when we use the term participants, we're automatically starting to create a hierarchy. We may not um, be meaning to do that, but there's a chance that if if you've been a participant in, let's say, a medical study, and then you come to a social sciences study and you get called a participant, you're going to see these barriers still where you're being worked on or for, not with. And the term co-researcher just allows for that equi equity between each other. Um, in my research study, I called myself the non-disabled researcher, and they were all my co-researchers. Now, again, specifically, I did that because I... When it came to looking at our identities as researchers in my in the research study, uh, for my co-researchers, their learning disability did not play a part in it whatsoever. So I quite liked the idea of them just being the co-researchers, but for me being defined as something different um, because it they were the ones who came up with all the ideas. It was their study. Uh, and I really wanted them to have the ownership and to me, to, for me to be defined as the different one. I thought that was quite important for me personally. A lot of other people wouldn't do that. Um, but the term co-researcher as well is really important when you're engaging because you're engaging in an inclusive research study. You're engaging with, the, with your group from the beginning. They're looking at co-creating in terms of the research topic, how you do your data collection, how you do your data analysis, how you um, use, use and create outputs and dissemination. Every part of that is co-created. So it's very important, uh, the term co-researchers, because it allows for that understanding from the get-go that everybody has equity within the research. Uh, so the next idea is co-creation and capacity building. So I've just kind of touched on the co-creation side of things. And whilst it's great to come to this and think, OK, so we're all going to have a part to play in all of this research project. Um, to start with, people might not want to. So in terms of my PhD study, my co-researchers got involved in everything from the get-go. However, when it came to writing my thesis, they really didn't want to help with that. Um, shockingly, I don't think I would have either. Uh, and they actually quite enjoyed lording it over me that I had to write this big thesis and they didn't. Um, but that was a really nice thing to see. And it was great for us all to have the ability to speak up and say, no, actually, I don't want to be involved in that. And that's a really great way of looking at it. And the other part that I wanted to talk about with co-creation is that it's very easy to assume that everybody knows how to do research, that everybody understands these terms, but they might not. And specifically, if you're working with marginalised communities, no matter what marginalised community it is, um, they may not have had any experience of research at any point in their life. So you really need to think about the um, what you're putting in place, what structures you're putting in place, what training you've got, in order to allow for people to build up their own capacities to create that equitable research environment. It's perfectly acceptable to say, oh, you know, I, I, I know a lot about um, data collection, so I'll do a little training session on that. 
But then to also say, you know, I I know nothing about the healthcare sector in terms of when it when being a person with a learning disability. So can you do a training session in that? And that's a really important thing as well, is the knowledge exchange is never just one way in an inclusive research study. It is constantly back and forth, which is really great. The final idea I want to talk about is reflexivity. This was a big learning curve for me as a PhD student in that we as researchers are taught to be in control of our research. Um, you know, you've got reports to make, you've got probation to pass, you've got this, you've got that. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is by being in control. But actually inclusive research um, asks you to step back a bit and lose control and allow for other people to change your ideas, adapt them to suit their needs and what they want from that research study. And that can be really quite difficult. And the only way that you can really do that is through reflecting on yourself, on your practice, and most importantly, on your privilege and your power within the group. Um, I remember in my study, I turned up and I was called, you know, a researcher, I was called this, I was called that, Mrs. Um, you know, referred to like a teacher. And it took an awful lot of reflection on my part to think about why did they refer to me in that way? How did I turn up and what did I, how did I present myself that made me seem like I was the most powerful within the group when in, in actual fact, that's not what I wanted from my research study at all. So it's an incredibly important thing to have in your toolbox as a researcher. I think not only if you're doing inclusive research, but just any type of research, it can be a really important thing to have, um, have there to fall back on. So finally, I just want to talk briefly about my experience. So I've kind of talked a lot around it, um, but talk about kind of how I went about doing inclusive research. So from the beginning, I involved the stakeholders of the charity themselves, My Life, My Choice, in planning. So planning for ethics committee, planning to get my... Um, to get through my initial probationary year for, as, on, as a PhD student so that we could begin our study together. Uh, that was a really nice thing to do for me because it allowed people who actually knew the group that I was going to be working with to have control over what we were planning to do. And they were also then able to take it back to the group and discuss it with them when perhaps I might not have been in a position to do that without ethical clearance. Um, what was also really nice and I think a really important part of my study and I know on reflection that it's not probably it's probably not something that most people can do um was I was able to go and visit and meet my co-researchers prior so I got to spend about three months so they had a month it was all done on a monthly meeting but I got to spend three months including a Christmas party getting to know my co-researchers and getting to break down those barriers um, and then throughout the process we just worked with one another we made friendships and we also made working relationships and it was really nice and um, it was it created an environment which was wonderful to work in, similar to working with people who you know in your career, you know, friends or colleagues that you work with. It felt very similar to that, which was really nice. And um, I'm very aware that I'm running out of time. So I just want to uh, offer the suggestions that my co-researchers said. So at the very end of our study, we got broken up by the joyous COVID pandemic and we... Um, so we did phone interviews in which we talked about the project and what suggestions we would have to any researchers that wanted to engage with the learning disabled community or also just marginalised communities. And these were the four suggestions they had. So help them people. So helping people to engage um, give it a go. Don't let your fear or your worries um, stop you. Just go on, try it out, support them. So support the communities in, in their engagement and talk to people. Uh, start those conversations with whoever you can um, and just keep the dialogue going and keep it open. So yeah, that was a very swift journey through inclusive research, but I think we have a couple of minutes uh, if anybody has any questions. 
Thank you so much, uh, Jess. That was very inspirational. Uh, I guess uh, you can raise a question in the chat. And yes, we have a few more minutes till we move to the next talk. But uh, I mean, you could use the chat functionality anytime uh, if, if you come up with a question. Um, so I suggest you move to the next talk. Um, Jess, I think I need to share my screen now. Uh, so the first, uh, the second presentation um, is about the opening research to non-professionals uh, through an approach to coin as community-led the citizen science. Um, in uh, uh, in an effort to put the context and some background literature in the presentation, I went back uh, to searching for participants and participatory research, and I came across this quote from the NHS in uh, in England saying that. Uh, uh, they are committed to involving consumers in research, not the subjects of research, but as active participants that take part in the different stages of research. This was back in 1998. Um, since, and the question raised was whether this was actually is something that is actually happening today, and if so, to what extent? And uh, actually, we can see varied and different ways people can be involved in research. Uh, in particular, in the field of citizen in science, we have seen different taxonomies or different, le different levels of participation in research. So they talked about uh, level one as the most uh, basic level of participation where uh, volunteers or citizens or participants are used to collect the data for scientists. Uh, the level two is a bit more advanced and it's about the volunteers analyzing data for scientists. The level three and four are much more advanced, I would say. Level three is participatory research. So volunteers or participants are defining a problem and they are defining also the process of data collection. The most uh, advanced or is called extreme level of participation is where participants uh, take part in all the stages of re research from problem definition to data collection and analysis. And I guess the Jess's experiences are live very well with this uh, level four extreme uh, citizen science. Uh, at the Open University where I am, uh, we are I am at the moment, we coined this instead of extreme citizen science, we called it citizen inquiry. And this is about the active engagement of the public in scientific activities in a way that they are actually defining their own research agenda, their own questions, how they want to collect data, how they want to interpret this data. Uh, he, while we originally talked about the citizen inquiry uh, or citizen science, uh, which is the most relevant concept, I would say, now, the last uh, year, we started talking more about community-led inquiry or community citizen science. And uh, there are several reasons behind this terminological change, I would say. The first uh, has to do with the term citizen and the fact that in the US it means specific things. Uh, you need to go through a process to become a citizen in the US. Also, by using uh, concepts like community, the emphasis uh, goes on collective action in order to change uh, something and bring a solution to your community. Um, so what do we do at the Open University to achieve this idea or operationalize this idea of community-led inquiry? We develop technologies that can help people and communities design their own studies and also processes where they can work closely with scientists to help them design those studies. Overall, uh, whatever we do with relation to participants, uh, we try to do it in a way that can bring learning benefits to those people who are, who are giving their data to, to researchers. And I will say more about it in the next few slides. So the, the technology we designed at the Open University is called Enquire, and it is an online tool or website. It's free to use. You can actually, uh, I'm not sure you can see the URL, just a second, it was here, but uh, is enquire.org.uk. Uh, it's free to use, and you can use it to design a study, pilot a study, use it to use it to collect your data, uh, visualize this data, and share your findings either in the form of a PDF or an interim report. And it's free 
for anyone that wants to design a study or take part in a study. As the, the, the platform, the website is also hosting several studies that scientists or communities ha have already set up. Uh, just a second to check the chat check the chat in case there is a question no it's absolutely fine um so why did we design enquire uh well the motivation was to help people especially those with no scientific or research, research background to learn uh, how research is done and how knowledge is produced and do we try to achieve that by giving them an opportunity to take part and learn from studies that are set by others and set up and manage their own personally relevant study. Um, the, the ultimate, I would say, objective is to help people start thinking more critically and more scientifically. And we think that this is actually a skill much needed uh, in order to understand and assess uh, the information around us, like fake news or any misinformation. So I think we think that that uh, thinking critically and scientifically is a skill that it should be developed uh, in, in, general, in the general public. Uh, at the moment, we work with several universities and non-academic organizations to set up uh, studies on Enquire. And mostly we have a long lasting col collaboration with the BBC. Actually, the Open University BBC partnership uh, sponsored the design of the latest version of Enquire, and they also run several studies on the platform. Uh, in uh, here, I'm, I'm just briefly. I just briefly want to say that to design your own study, there is an authoring tool, a functionality that takes you step by step in the process of uh, what to do in order to design a study, and is giving you also uh, some scaffolding and support as to what is needed in each step. Uh, also, here I'm just emphasizing the piloting uh, functionality. So at any moment, you can get a private URL and share it with people and pilot your study questions. Uh, what is the outcome now of this process of designing? You can design two different studies or we call them mission on inquire. Confidential missions or confidential studies are more like the survey-like uh, uh, studies we often see or we come across in social media or elsewhere. Uh, here we have uh, a, a example, uh, the example of the Garden Watch, which was actually in collaboration with the BBC Spring Watch. And it was one of the most, of the biggest the studies we had on Enquire attracting more than 230,000 people um, that engage in uh, capturing and sharing who is living in their gardens. Uh, the other type of studies we have, which I would say is relatively uncommon at the moment, are social uh, missions. In these studies, all the data is open. So the moment you write down your responses, these become public and anyone can read them, comment on and or like them. Uh, also in those studies, is you can get uh, data visualizations. And I think I have a slide for that. The no, I have it after actually. Uh, so the data visualizations, they show you graphically in a graphic manner what data looks like the moment you visit the platform. And it's changing dynamically the more people take part in a study. So this is the example of a social mission. We ask people to capture the level of noise in their, uh, where they live or work. And the, uh, you can see here the data pinned on a map and also the noise uh, uh, graphs for each from each participant and all this is all this data is open for you to see at any time on the website and as long as the study is, is live it has, hasn't been ended and these are the data visualizations I mentioned before, uh, which are dynamic and they are changing the more people are taking part in a study. Uh, for us, it's a very important development because in a way it minimizes the time gap between a person taking part in a study and accessing findings. Normally, this may take months or years for scientists to produce and share a report. Uh, with this development here, you can actually get a sense of preliminary findings findings the moment the study is running. Um, now, I, I said earlier uh, that uh, we design studies in ways that can support uh, learning for participants. So we're not just getting the, the a scientists extracting or getting the data uh, of people. We try to give them something back uh, the moment they take part in a study. Uh, so our participants can either create their own studies or can take part in a study designed by someone else. 
Uh, what we did was uh, a survey trying to understand whether people are actually learning something from taking part uh, in inquiry studies. Uh, we had 150 participants answering. The great majority took part in one study on inquiry. So it was a short survey asking them a number of questions about and, and aiming to find the factors that facilitate or inhibit participation in, in research that is led by scientists and the intention of of volunteers or participants to create their own studies. Um, one of the first questions we asked was, why did you take part in a study on NQIR? And it seems that the great majority did so in order to contribute to research and science. And also they mentioned other factors like uh, science is important, I had an interest in the topic, or I wanted to learn more uh, about uh, a study. Um, now, this is this is one of the interesting questions we ask them, whether they have actually learned something new after they took part in a study on NQIR. And we found that uh, nearly half of them, they said that they know a little bit more about the topic of the mission, and 8% a lot more. And uh, the learning was around increased awareness about the topic. Uh, and you can read the quotes here, what exactly they became more aware of. Uh, they they develop a desire to learn more about the topic. Uh, so this person here developed a desire to find out more through books uh, about um, uh, the, I think it was birth identification. Uh, some said that uh, there was a change in my everyday habits. Uh, I listen more to ambient sounds in nature. And uh, another person said that uh, I'm, I'm now intending to take action to support biodiversity. Uh, so it seems that they took part in studies that were related to nature and biodiversity, and that's why some of these quotes are, are, are related to that. Uh, now, another great percentage said that, uh, no, there was no change in our knowledge, and this was possibly an issue of the timing of the survey. We administered the, uh, administrated the survey quite late, and after a few months, they took part in a study on inquiry. Also, they said that they had previous knowledge about the topic, so this meant that they did didn't really find something new by taking part in the study. And maybe the most uh, interesting finding was this last comment here saying, I wasn't informed about the findings of the study, uh, which in a way points back to us, the scientists, as to how we, as to how and when we communicate findings from our research to participants. I'm just checking the chat. No, no questions. Okay. And my last two slides, I guess. Uh, the other question we asked whether they would be willing or would consider in the future to design their own study. And they, here you can see that the great majority, more than 70, 80% said no. So they do not really see themselves as researchers or as creating their own studies. And they explain that with a number of factors, including a lack of time, lack of knowledge and skills, they need to have some support. Uh, they, they weren't aware actually that this is possible. And perhaps uh, to me, the most interesting was that uh, some people said that creating a project or a study is not for them. So it seems that there is a widespread notion that uh, research can only be done by scientists and not by people that do not have the qualifications to do so. So my conclusions or takeaway messages from this uh, presentation, and I hope I am on time. Uh, there are tools, free tools like Enquire that can help any individual or community to design their own study. And these tools are coming with support from scientists, at least at the Open University, uh, where we manage Enquire. Uh, there are benefits, learning benefits uh, from taking part in scientific studies, especially when these are when these well designed and uh, they are designed with learning in mind. How can we give something back to our participants. Uh, there is a need to make the public more aware of the importance of creating their own studies. And this has to do with uh, local decision-making, uh, owning solutions and uh, resulting in more sustainable solutions when these are owned by communities. And also about uh, more active uh, citizenship. And the last point I want to raise is that universities should open their doors to communities in ways that they can facilitate 
community-led the research. So they should start working more closely with communities in a more equitable manner. And I think this goes back to just as uh, uh, discussion around the equitable access and participation. Uh, this was my last slide. Uh, I would like to thank you for listening and I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so I'm looking at the chat. Uh, how do you find people that can be interested in your topic? Well, normally we approach community organizations that uh, relate to the people we would like to work with. And normally those organizations have contacts to community members and uh, they become the um, uh, bridge between the university and the community because they have access to the people or the participants we would like to engage with. Um, so the, up, up to now, this is, at least in my experience, is something that worked uh, really well. And thanks, Sylvia, for, for asking that. So I don't know if there are any other questions, but feel, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, I will move to the next and last talk uh, from uh, Professor Bart Rientes. It's again from the Open University. Um, but I'm not sure you can control the screen. I think you cannot. So uh, I would be happy to move the slides for you unless you want to do something different. Yeah, it would be great because I just have a couple of slides. So, um, so thank you very much for uh, the two really interesting presentations, which is really, really exciting and really builds on the next narrative. And um, so if next slide, <laughs> what we're particularly looking for uh, today, but also on the um, 21st of March, is to think about, okay, how can we make this open science and scholarship um, work for data intensive subjects like learning analytics? And um, this is a shameless plug that we're doing a half day workshop, really discussing in great depth what the affordances and limitations of um, open science and scholarship are and how we as, as a participant in society have to deal with this. And um, the next element, uh, the, uh, this is actually run by a range of researchers across the globe. And ori originally there was a critique done by Christopher Brooks, who indicated, okay, what is SOLAR, the Society of Learning Analytics Research, doing about open science? And uh, as soon as you raise a critique, then, of course, you have to uh, organize a follow-up reaction. So uh, you're more than welcome to join this workshop. So we're just going to give you a taste today of what we're going to discuss, and we would be keen to have your uh, insights for the next slide, please, Thea. Um, so the last remaining 10 minutes, it would be interesting to think about some of the questions that, um, of course, we won't have the answers for today. But... Think about these questions in your mind. So what could um, or what should SOLAR or organizations like Eden do to encourage open science and scholarship? What may prevent researchers, and I think it was really nice from uh, Jess's word in terms of inclusive research, what prevents participants in these conferences from contributing to open science? And then in particular um, for SOLAR, but perhaps this may also apply for Eden, is what kind of methodological approaches could be made more open and why and why not. And last but not least, um, and it's a, a kind of tragedy of the commons, it's often really difficult to encourage participants or research in general to uh, publish in open science or open scholarship ways. So how can we make that more attractive and relevant? And what we aim to do at the workshop is to write a policy paper <clears throat> that hopefully will drive uh, development forward. So if you're really interested, um, although the workshop is full, um, you're more than welcome to contribute also online. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a brief two words on what is open science and what is open scholarship. So uh, Fernand Frieske basically defined five broad open science schools. And of course, there are many different ways how you can conceptualize open science. So oftentimes people think in terms of open science as a kind of infrastructure that needs to be in place or a kind of school of thought, a kind of public school where everything needs to be uh, publicly available. There are also researchers and uh, policymakers who think, well, it's actually about being very clear and specific on how you've actually measured what you have done and um, 
how it's uh, impacting the, the wider society. Um, then there is a, the, a fourth school, which is basically just mere principle and I think this resonates also with the current crisis, is this de de democratic school of, well, we just have to make sure that everyone across the planet has access to knowledge. And then last but not least, there is the kind of pragmatic school that basically assumes, and I think, for example, the COVID vaccine is a fantastic example. By working together, we as researchers can help each other and can um, tackle really big, complex uh, problems. So basically what uh, Fechner and Frieske indicate that there is a lot of emphasis on trying to make research artifacts openly available and allow uh, researchers to check and reproduce published findings, um, as well as also to, to help people to uh, get a lot of data and to uh, and generalizability and cross-validation. Um, open scholarship is slightly broader than open science, and that basically tries to start from um, the beginning in terms of making sure that whatever you do in terms of your research, you make this openly available. So the example that's just uh, presented at the beginning are a really good approach to make sure that from the beginning, you start to think about <clears throat> how you can include all participants, but also make that available while you're doing the research. Oftentimes we as researchers basically, you know, think the research is finished once it's published but um, there's an increasing focus on making all the steps of our process available. This sounds great, um, but what are the, the, the limitations? So that's the next slide there, Thea. So um, there are, of course, some concerns about open science, and, there, and some of these concerns could be legitimate or maybe not relevant for your context, but oftentimes um, there is a debate about the kinds of research that um, are easy to facilitate in an open science manner. So if you do some really hardcore data mining of objective uh, behaviors of people or animals or molecules, um, it's relatively easy to, to share those findings. But what if you're doing some really in-depth um, qualitative work? Uh, the examples that uh, Jess uh, illustrated or some of the work that Thea has represented. How do you make sure that that is actually available? So what if everyone has to do open science and your particular doctrine doesn't fit with, um, you know, doing open science? Leads also perhaps to some equality um, um, and uh, equity issues amongst participants. So for example, <laughs> even if you make all your data available, um, it might be <laughs> that um, for some reason, there are some unexpected uh, findings that might occur. So for example, in a large open access database about OU Analyze, which gathers lots of data about students, and we recently found that where students are located in the region had a fundamental impact on whether or not this, um, whether students were successful. But the, the location that people are based on basically had nothing to do with them as an individual. It just illustrated the social and economic uh, context in which they were working. So you might, as researchers, find some really complex and um, strong ethical and equality challenges that you may not foresee when you publish your data in an open science manner. Linked to the second point is the ethical implications in terms of doing research. Um, it is difficult to, to, sh to make data anonymous, but, uh, but in particular, when you're making data available from multiple uh, different sources. So I saw um, that a mentor posted uh, an interesting question about the social networks of people. Um, obviously, um, it's really difficult once you start to make social networks, for example, if your students' interactions make that publicly available, how do you anonymize that data? How do you... How do you bring that uh, together? Then there are um, intellectual property and legal challenges, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there might also be reputational damages. And last but not least, it's time consuming. So the next slide basically goes a little bit deeper into that. So it could well be that if you have all this data available in your institution and you find with all this learning analytics approaches that particular students could have been identified at a very early stage 
of never being able to complete a degree. But nonetheless, we basically ask them to join a degree and pay for that degree. So what if you make that data available and then a student sues the university for not giving him or her uh, appropriate uh, support? In addition, the next uh, um, element, sorry, the, uh, it could well be that a lot of um, um, really innovation um, that is made available. I was listening this morning to uh, uh, the BBC Radio 4 about gene sequencing. And um, one of the biggest advances made in gene sequencing was that it was basically linked with venture capitalism and um, being able to monetize some of the amazing innovations that were um, done. So if you make everything open, what is the incentive for researchers to share uh, this? Then there could be a reputational damage. So if you publish your data set, and you publish a range of articles and then somebody else finds out that you've made an error in your data. What if you did this on purpose? Or what if you made a mistake? How can you, you know, make sure that whatever you publish, I mean, we're only human and this may actually paralyze research from sharing because you may not want to show that you've made some uh, mistake. Um, and finally, um, it can be quite expensive to make data openly um, accessible. So um, especially if you have complex data from multiple waves or qualitative data, um, you know, it's very, very expensive. And I think what says Selena posted in the chat, the reputational damage could also be done by uh, publishing in, in predatory journals. It could well be that when you publish your open data or your open science work that others might reuse your materials and then publish it in another um, field. We recently had some um, people copy pasting um, creative comment articles and rewriting it in a different way and basically not attributing to it. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a difficult um, issue. Next slide, please, here. So I guess what, what I would like to use the last five minutes for today is to think about, well, what, what ideas do you have in terms of how can we overcome this kind of, well, this tragedy of the commons, this classical collective action problem? So how could we make sure that we really encourage people to uh, engage with open science and scholarship? And perhaps we could also discuss, and this, I leave this completely up to you, what prevents practitioners and researchers from contributing to open science. So if we better understand what prevents research, perhaps we can also overcome this. Another thing that we potentially could discuss is some practices uh, might easily adopt these open science principles, but others may not. So what, what could these fields be? And last and not least, um, what could we as an organization do to make um, open science more attractive? Um, and also acknowledging that not all scholarship can be made um, available openly, and maybe we don't want to make everything open. So I'm going to pause here because I don't have the answers, but I'm keen to hear what you think in terms of what we could do to um, raise the flag for open science, but also be mindful of the potential negative impacts that might occur over time. So um, yeah, I, I know that you can't speak up, so you have to do it in the chat, but I'm keen to hear any thoughts. Thank you so much, Bart. That was uh, really brilliant. And I think a good uh, concluding talk <laughs> had built on the previous two. So yes, I guess if you have any questions, they should go in, in chat because that's the only way you could communicate today. Please feel free to add any comments or thoughts or questions in chat. Well, if we have no questions, I guess this is the uh, ending of the session. Um, I would encourage all of you, if you come up with any thoughts or questions, you could email any of us uh, and we could be more than happy to answer any questions that may, they may come up or appear later on. Um, I would like to thank you all for uh, joining the session today and especially thanks to Jess and Bart for uh, joining me <laughs> to this session on uh, research and democratization. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of the day and we speak soon. Bye-bye.